to be queen, sovereign head of a great commonwealth of nations at the early age of 25, called to the exercise of those functions of majesty which, although they've changed with the passage of years, remain of supreme importance to the good government of all within her realm, this was the destiny which devolved upon the young princess at the death of her father. From early years, Princess Elizabeth must have been conscious that she might be queen someday as she watched her father's coronation. This solemn thought may well have been in her mind. And all her parents' training must have been at least subconsciously directed towards preparing her for that destiny. Childhood was sheltered, as childhood should be, devoted to the serene joys of family life. Only occasionally did the young princess and her sister appear in public for the royal tournament or perhaps the older shot to two. Occasionally there were glimpses of them on the balcony of Buckingham Palace or at the great occasions of state, but it was the determination of the king and queen that their daughters should enjoy their childhood in tranquility. Princess Elizabeth was 13 in 1939. The King and Queen were due to start on a tour of Canada and these intimate pictures were taken on a windy day below the terrace at Buckingham Palace. It was just before the Second World War and their Majesty's return was welcomed with affectionate relief, not only by the princesses, but by the whole British people anxious about the international situation. On the mind of Princess Elizabeth, a deep impression must have been made by her parents' absence and by the happy family reunion, while events were rapidly shaping towards the outbreak of war. The king did not send his daughters out of the country in the days of greatest danger when Britain stood alone. The king and queen stayed and the princesses stayed too. And at a time when the immediate perils had abated, these pictures were taken at Windsor. Delightful family pictures reflecting the happy atmosphere in which Princess Elizabeth was growing up. Princess Margaret's knitting is the subject of interest here. Her sister has taken it over to straighten things out but she herself drops a stitch, much to her mother's amusement. And yet, of course, in the background of these friendly scenes, there must be reckoned a sense of the grim events of the long drawn out war with Germany and Japan, which were imprinting their solemn lessons on all young, impressionable minds. On her 18th birthday, the princess came of age, as is the law for royalty. She was studying hard, equipping herself with knowledge for the future, but she was also anxious to take some active role in the war effort. For some time she had been a member of a Sea Rangers troop. Now she secured the King's permission to join the Auxiliary Territorial Service. She became an AT and learnt to drive lorries. She was still an officer in the ATS on that joyful day when the war with Germany ended. Now, being of age, she began to fulfill the official public duties of royalty. She launched the new aircraft carrier Eagle, built in Northern Ireland. In another great ship, which she also launched, HMS Vanguard, she voyaged with her parents to Cape Town, joining with spirit in the deck games of the young naval officer. This was the beginning of that memorable South African tour which took the royal family all over the Union and into the Rhodesias, meeting the people and seeing the magnificent scenery and spectacles of those vast lands.
Princess Elizabeth celebrated her 21st birthday in South Africa, the words in which she broadcast her thoughts on that occasion were moving in the extreme and endowed with particular meaning for the present time. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me, as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow, and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. Later that year, her engagement was announced. The Duke of Edinburgh, now so familiar and popular a figure, was then practically unknown to the public, but when these pictures were published, instinctively the public knew that it was going to be a very happy marriage, not only for the two persons most concerned, but also for the peoples of the Commonwealth. The royal wedding was indeed an event not merely of splendor, but of genuine rejoicing. The radiant happiness of the princess appealed to the heart, while her choice of husband appealed to the judgment. Prince Philip had been trained for the sea. As a midshipman, he'd taken part in the Battle of Cape Matapan. It was in character that he should desire to continue his career as a naval officer. It was also in character that the princess should not discourage him. But before he went away to undertake a spell of service at sea, the royal couple became the happy parents of a baby son who was christened Charles. Later, these delightful pictures were taken of the small family in the garden of their country home near Ascot. Lieutenant Commander, the Duke of Edinburgh, was appointed to the command of HMS Magpie and left his home to join his ship at Malta. Like every sailor's wife, the princess longed to follow him and when some short respite from her public duties was given, she flew out to Malta to be with him. But now a sad and serious turn in the affairs of the royal family was taking place. The king's leg was giving him trouble and rest was absolutely necessary. Other members of the royal family had to take over many of his official duties. Among them, Princess Elizabeth deputized for him at the ceremony of trooping the color. The king made a wonderful recovery from that illness, but his health was undermined. Another, more serious illness involved an operation on his lung. The operation was successful, and the princess and duke were able to leave for their projected tour of Canada. This tour took them from coast to coast, from the citadel at Quebec to the magnificent vistas of the Rocky Mountains. Canadians everywhere crowded the route and grasped at the chance to see their princess and proclaim their loyalty to the throne. Everywhere concern was shown for the king's health and nowhere more than in Washington, which the royal couple visited to express their friendship for the American Republic and to make the acquaintance of President Truman. <laughs> 